This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 43 The next and following days were spent in removing our furniture and property, particularly our poultry, which had multiplied greatly. We also constructed a poultry yard at a sufficient distance from our house to save our sleep from disturbance, and still so near that we could easily tend them. We made it as a continuation of the colonnade, and on the same plan, but enclosed in the front by a sort of wire trellis work, which Fritz and Jack made wonderfully well. Fritz, who had a turn for architecture and mechanics, gave me some good hints, especially one which we put into execution. This was to carry the water from the basin of the fountain through the poultry-yard, which enabled us also to have a little pond for our ducks. The pigeons had their abode above the hen-roosts, in some pretty baskets, which Ernest and Francis made, similar to those made by the savages of the Friendly Isles, of which they had seen engravings in Cook's voyages. When all was finished, my wife was delighted to think that even in the rainy season she could attend to her feathered family and collect their eggs. "'What a difference!' said she, admiring the elegance of our buildings. "'What a difference between this tent-house and the original dwelling that suggested the name to us, and which was our only shelter four years ago! What a surprising progress luxury has made with us in that time! Do you remember, my dear, the barrel which served us for a table?' and the oyster-shells for spoons, and the tent where we slept, crowded together on dried leaves, and without undressing, and the river half a mile off, where we were obliged to go to drink if we were thirsty. Compared to what we were then, we are now great lords. "'Kings, you mean, Mama," said Jack, "'for all this island is ours, and it is quite like a kingdom.' "'And how many millions of subjects does Prince Jack reckon in the kingdom of his august father?' said I. Prince Jack declared he had not yet counted the parrots, kangaroos, agoutis, and monkeys. The laughter of his brothers stopped him. I then agreed with my wife that our luxuries had increased, but I explained to her that this was the result of our industry. All civilized nations have commenced as we did, Necessity has developed the intellect which God has given to man alone, and by degrees the arts have progressed, and knowledge has extended more, perhaps, than is conducive to happiness. What appeared luxury to us now was still simplicity compared with the luxury of towns, or even villages among civilized nations. My wife declared she had everything she wished for, and should not know what more to ask for as we now had only to rest and enjoy our happiness. I declared against spending our time in rest and indolence as the sure means of ending our pleasure, and I well knew my dear wife was, like myself, an enemy to idleness, but she dreaded any more laborious undertakings. "'But, Mama," said Fritz, "'you must let me make a mill under the cascade. It will be so useful when our corn grows, and even now for the maize.' I also think of making an oven in the kitchen, which will be very useful for you to bake your bread in." "'These would indeed be useful labours,' said the good mother, smiling. "'But can you accomplish them?' "'I hope so,' said Fritz, with the help of God and that of my dear brothers." Ernest promised his best aid, in return for his brother's kind services in forming his grotto only requesting occasional leisure for his natural history collections. His mother did not see the utility of these collections, but, willing to indulge her kind and attentive earnest, she offered, till she could walk well, to assist him in arranging and labelling his plants, which were yet in disorder, and he gratefully consented. In procuring her some paper for the purpose, of which I had brought a large quantity from the vessel, I brought out an unopened packet, amongst which was a piece of some fabric, neither paper nor stuff, apparently. We examined it together, and at length remembered it was a piece of stuff made at Odahaita, 
which our captain had bought of a native at an island where we had touched on our voyage. Fritz appearing much interested in examining this cloth, Ernest said gravely, I can teach you how to make it, and immediately bringing Cook's voyages, where a detailed description is given, he proceeded to read it. Fritz was disappointed to find it could only be made of the bark of three trees. Of these our island produced only one. These trees were the mulberry tree, the breadfruit, and the wild fig. We had the last in abundance, but of the two former we had not yet discovered a single plant. Fritz was not, however, discouraged. They ought to be here, said he, since they are found in all the South Sea islands. Perhaps we may find them on the other side of the rocks, where I saw some superb unknown trees from the height where we discovered the grotto. And who knows, but I may find my pretty gazelle there again. The rogue can leap better than I can over those rocks. I had a great wish to descend them, but found it impossible. Some are very high and perpendicular. Others have overhanging summits. I might, however, get round as you did by the pass, between the torrent and the rocks at Great Bay. Jack offered to be his guide, even with his eyes shut, into that rich country where he conquered and captured his buffalo and Ernest begged to be of the party. As this was an expedition I had long projected, I agreed to accompany them next day, their mother being content to have Francis left with her as a protector. I cautioned Fritz not to fire off his gun when we approached the buffaloes, as any show of hostility might render them furious. Otherwise the animals, unaccustomed to man, had no fear of him, and will not harm him. In general, added I, I cannot sufficiently recommend to you to be careful of your powder. We have not more than will last us a year, and there may be a necessity to have recourse to it for our defence. I have a plan for making it, said Fritz, who never saw a difficulty in anything. I know it is composed of charcoal, saltpetre, and sulphur, and we ought to find all these materials in the island. It is only necessary to combine them, and to form it into little round grains. This is my only difficulty, but I will consider it over, and I have my mill to think on first. I have a confused recollection of a powder manufactory at Bern. There was some machinery which went by water. This machinery moved some hammers, which pounded and mixed the ingredients. Was this not the case, father? Something like it, said I but we have many things to do before making powder. First, we must go to sleep. We must set out before daybreak, if we intend to return to-morrow evening. We did indeed rise before the sun, which would not rise for us. The sky was very cloudy, and shortly we had an abundant and incessant rain, which obliged us to defer our journey, and put us all in bad humour, but my wife, who was not sorry to keep us with her, and who declared this gracious rain would water her garden, and bring it forward. Fritz was the first who consoled himself. He thought on nothing but building mills and manufacturing gunpowder. He begged me to draw him a mill. This was very easy, so far as regards the exterior, that is, the wheel and the waterfall that sets it in motion, but the interior, the disposition of the wheels, the stones to bruise the grain, the sieve or bolter to separate the flour from the bran. All this complicated machinery was difficult to explain, but he comprehended all, adding his usual expression, I will try, and I will succeed. Not to lose any time, and to profit by this rainy day, he began by making sieves of different materials, which he fastened to a circle of pliant wood and tried by passing through them the flower of the cassava. He made some with sailcloth, others with the hair of the onagra, which is very long and strong, and some of the fibres of bark. His mother admired his work, which he continued to improve more and more. She assured him the sieve would be sufficient for her. It was useless to have the trouble of building a mill. "'But how shall we bruise the grain, Mama? said he. It would be tedious and hard work. "'And you think there will be no hard work in building your mill?' said Jack. 
I'm curious to see how you will contrive to form that huge stone which is called the millstone. You shall see, said Fritz. Only find me the stone, and it shall soon be done. Do you think, father, that of our rock would be suitable? I told him I thought it would be hard enough, but it would be difficult to cut from the rock a piece large enough for the purpose. He made his usual reply. I will try. Ernest and Jack will assist me, and perhaps you, papa. I declared my willingness, but named him the Master Mason. We must only be his workmen. Francis was impatient to see the mill in operation. Oh, said Jack, you shall soon have that pleasure. It is a mere trifle. We only want stone, wood, tools, and science. At the word science, Ernest, who was reading in a corner without listening to us, raised his head suddenly, saying, What science are you in need of? Of one you know nothing of, Mr. Philosopher, said Jack. Come, tell us, do you know how to build a mill? A mill? answered Ernest. Of what description? There are many sorts. I was just looking in my dictionary for it. There are corn mills and powder mills, oil mills, wind mills, water mills, hand mills, and saw mills. Which do you want? Fritz would have liked them all. You remind me, said I, that we brought from the vessel a hand mill and a saw mill, taken to pieces, to be sure, but numbered and labelled, so that they might easily be united. They should be in the magazine, where you found the anvil and iron bars. I had forgotten them. Let's go and examine them, said Fritz, lighting his lantern. I shall get some ideas from them. Rather, said his mother, they will spare you the trouble of thinking and labouring. I sent them all four to seek these treasures, which, heaped in an obscure corner of the storeroom, had escaped my recollection. When we were alone, I seriously besought my wife not to oppose any occupations our children might plan, however they might seem beyond their power, the great point being to keep them continually occupied, so that no evil or dangerous fancies might fill their minds. Let them, I said, cut stone, fell trees, or dig fountains, and bless God that their thoughts are so innocently directed. She understood me, and promised not to discourage them, only fearing the excessive fatigue of these undertakings. Our boys returned from the magazine, delighted with what they had found, and loaded with work tools. Those of the masons, the chisel, the short hammer, and the trowel, were not to be found, and rarely are taken out to sea. But they had collected a great number of carpenter's tools, saws, planes, rules, etc., and now that Fritz was a smith, he had no difficulty in making any tool he wanted. He was loaded on each shoulder and in each hand he brought a specimen of gunpowder. One sort was in good condition, and they had found a barrel of it. The other was much damaged by the water. Jack and Francis were also bending under the weight of various articles, among which I saw some pieces of the hand-mill Fritz wished to examine. Ernest, always rather idle, came proudly on, with a leather belt across his shoulders, to which was suspended a large tin box for plants, and a leather portmanteau for stones, minerals, and shells. His brothers, even Francis, rallied him unmercifully on his immense burden. One offered to help him, another to go and bring the ass. He preserved his grave and thoughtful air, and extended himself on a seat near his mother, who was occupied with his specimens of natural history. Jack deposited his load in a corner and ran out. We soon saw him return with a huge screw-machine on his head, which he placed before Ernest, saying with an air of respect, I have the honour to bring for his highness the prince of the idle penguins, the press for his august plants, which his highness doubtless found too heavy, and truly it is no little weight. Ernest did not know whether to thank him or be angry but he decided to join him in the jest, and therefore answered gravely that he was distressed that His Highness the Prince of the Monkeys should have taken so much trouble to oblige him, that he ought to have employed some of his docile subjects to do it, 
After all, he confessed that the press, which he had not noticed, gave him great pleasure, and he placed some plants in it immediately, which he had collected the evening before. The rain ceasing for a short time, I went with Fritz and Jack to examine our embankment, and to open the sluices of the pond. We found all right, and our garden looking beautiful after the rain. On our return we looked in at the Grotto Ernestine, which we found inundated from the opening above. We proposed to make a trench or a little channel to carry off the rain-water from it. We returned home and retired to bed in hopes of being able to set out next morning. We were, however, again disappointed, and for a longer period than we expected. The rain continued some days, and the country was again a complete lake. We had, however, no storm or wind, and our possessions did not suffer, so we resolved to wait patiently till the weather would permit us to go. My wife was delighted to be in her comfortable abode, and to have us round her. Neither did we waste the time. Ernest finished the arrangement of his collection with his mother and Francis. Fritz and Jack prepared the tools that they wanted in their great undertaking. The first attempt was to be a sawmill. In order to prepare the planks they wished, a very large saw which they had found amongst the tools would serve their purpose, but it was necessary to set it in motion by water, and here was the difficulty. Fritz made several models from the thin wood of our chests, and the wheels of our guns, but they were too small. In the meantime, the mind of my young mechanic was exercised, his ideas were enlarged and improved, and as this science was so necessary in our situation, I allowed him to go on with his experiments. Notwithstanding the rain, protected by my cloak, he went several times to the cascade to look out for a place where he should place his mills to the best advantage and have a constant supply of water. Ernest assisted him by his advice, and promised his labor when it should be needed. Jack and Francis were helping their mother to card cotton, of which she had made a large collection, intending to spin it for our clothing, and I exercised my mechanical talents in turning a large wheel for her, which was necessary should revolve very easily, her leg being still stiff, and a reel by which four bobbins were filled at once by turning a handle. These different occupations aided us to pass the rainy season, which visited us earlier this year, and did not remain so long. My wife knew something of dyeing cloth, and some of the plants she had helped Ernest to dry, having left their color on the papers, she made some experiments, and succeeded in obtaining a very pretty blue to dye our clothes with and with the cochineal from our fig-tree, a beautiful red-brown, with which she had dyed for herself a complete dress. Thus passed several weeks. Ernest read to us from some amusing or instructive work every evening, and when his collections were all put in order, he worked at his lathe, or at the business of weaving. At last the sun appeared. We spent some days enjoying it in our delightful colonnade. We went to visit the grotto and the garden, where all was going on well. The embankment had prevented the inundation. Satisfied with our work, we now fixed our departure for the next day, once more hoping the rain would not come again to disappoint us. End of chapter.